Hi, I'm Akash, co-founder and CEO of Jovia. Today, I'm really excited to share with you this practical and hands-on introduction to web development with Python from scratch. In this tutorial, you will watch me build and deploy a Jovian careers website to the cloud using free online resources. You can follow along to build your own personal website. Post your website in the comments because we are giving away one Jovian swag pack every month to the best website created by following this tutorial. If you have any questions, post them in the comments and we'll help you out. So let's get started. We want to explore web development and deployment using Python and its ecosystem of libraries. And we will do this by creating a Jovian careers website where we can list job openings at Jovian and people can apply to those jobs. So after this lesson, you should be in a position to build and deploy your own website, maybe a personal website, a portfolio or some sample application. There are no prerequisites here apart from Python and Git. So here are some of the topics that we are going to look at. We're going to look at how to use GitHub for creating a project and Replit for working on a project. We will talk about the Flask web framework, which is used to create web applications in Python. We will touch on HTML and CSS. We will talk about the Bootstrap framework, which will help us make our website look a little better with less effort. And then we will talk about deployment on cloud platforms. Specifically, we are going to deploy to render.com. And finally, we will talk about how to set up your own custom domain and configure it to point it to the website that you have created and deployed. The first step is to create a project on GitHub. Now GitHub, as you might already know, is a platform for sharing and collaborating on software development projects. And it is powered by Git, which is a version control system, which lets you record every version of your project as you make changes. So the first thing you want to do is go to github.com and then sign in or create an account if you haven't done that already. And once you're logged into github.com, this is the screen that you will see. But in this busy interface, what you're looking for is this new button. This is the new repository or new project button. If you don't see this new button, there's also a plus button here on the top right, which you can use and just select new repository. Now, once you try to create a new repository, you will have to select an owner, which will be your GitHub account, your GitHub username. And then we need to give this repository a name. So this has to be one or more lowercase words separated by hyphens. So I'm going to call it Jovian careers website. And we can give this a description if you want. So I'm just going to say a careers website for Jovian. And I'm going to make this public so that anybody can access it. And I'm also going to add a readme file because this will initialize the repository. So I don't have to push anything to the repository to get started. And then I'm also going to add a git ignore file. So as we do our development, a lot of build files and compiled files and intermediate files are created by Python, which we may not want to put into Git because they are not actual source code. They are simply used to run the code. So to ignore all of these intermediate output files that are created, you can select a dot git ignore file that can get added to the root of your repository. Now, depending on the kind of project you're working on, the kind of language you're using, the kind of files that you need to exclude may differ. So GitHub has already provided a git ignore template for Python. And we just select that so that we don't accidentally end up adding any intermediate compiled files or output files into our repository. And finally, if you're making your repository public, it's always a good idea to include a license, which lets others know how they can use it, whether they can use it commercially, whether they can build on top of it or not. And I'm just going to select the MIT license here, which is the most liberal license that's available. And that's it. And now we can create the repository. So now the repository is created and you can see here, it contains a readme file, which is rendered as markdown. So it just contains the name of the repository. It also contains a license file that you can read and it contains a dot git ignore file. If you click on it, contains information about the kind of files that should be excluded from Git. And these are all the intermediate files that might get created. 
when you're running your Python code. So let's go back here and take this. The next step is to open up this project on the platform replit.com. So here, this project is on GitHub. GitHub can be used to store projects, can be used to share projects, but cannot be used to develop projects. Now that's where you might want to use this cloud platform called Replit. And replit.com is an online free collaborative in-browser IDE. IDE refers to integrated development environment. So what that means is it can connect to your GitHub account and it can let you write code on the cloud and you don't have to install anything on your computer and your code will be synced to the cloud and you can access it from anywhere. So you can go to replit.com and you can then sign up or log in to replit. So I'm just going to log in because I already have an account. And once you log in, this will bring you to your replit dashboard. Now here you can create new projects, but ideally you want to use GitHub to keep track of your projects. So you can scroll down here. and you can click on connect GitHub. So let's click connect GitHub. And here you might want to then select what exactly you want to give Replit access to. So in my case, I'm going to click on my name and I can choose to authorize all the repositories I have so that any repository I have on GitHub, I can develop with Replit or I can choose to only give access to select repositories. Now in this case, I'm just going to give access to select repositories because I have a whole bunch of repositories. So let's see, Jovian Careers website. Okay, that looks great. And these are the permissions that Replit is going to get. It is going to be able to read the code from GitHub and it is going to be able to write code back into GitHub. So let's install and authorize. And that should now bring us to the Replit dashboard. And now you should see a GitHub repos section on your Replit dashboard. And here you can see whichever repositories you've selected, Replit will have access here. So let me now click on this and let me see what happens. So now it's going to import this repository. So that means all the code from GitHub. And I'm going to make this REPL public. So just like my repository is public, I also want to make my Replit project public. And let me then click import from GitHub. And that's going to load up all the files that we had seen here, git ignore, license and readme.md. And it's now going to show these files on Replit. Now, everything you build will ultimately have to be run in a certain way. So you can configure a run command and every time you click this run button, the run command that you configure here is going to be executed and the output is going to be shown here in this console tab. I'm going to type python app.py as the command that will be executed when the run button is clicked. So I'm going to click done and this is going to create a file called .replit within the repository which contains this information and informs replit. This is a python3 project and the run button should run python app.py. Now you may notice that this dot replit file is not visible here and that's because it is a hidden file. So you can just click on these three dots and say show hidden files and that's going to show the dot replit file which is just hidden from you by default. So now we have this project open on replit. You can see here we have a file sidebar. The file sidebar contains a list of files that are present. This is the same git ignore file we had. This is the same license file we had and this is the same readme file we had. And we can choose to then show a preview, which is shown here, or we can hide the preview. So that's the files tab. And here is the file editor. This is where we can edit the code. And finally, here we have two things. We have a console, which shows the output of the run button. And we have a shell, which is just like a terminal or a command line interface where you can run any command line utilities like LS or PWD or CD or whatever you want to do. Let me click the run button and see what happens. And the first thing it does is it tries to run the command python app.py and it says that python cannot open the file app.py because there is no such file or directory. We have not created the file yet. So I'm just going to click plus here to create a new file and I'm going to call it app.py. 
and let's just print hello world here and let's run it and now you can see that the code was executed python app.py and hello world the output was displayed here so now we have got our project imported into replit and we are now already developing it we can open up files we can change the code and then we can run the code and of course we don't have to use the run button we can come in here and we can say python app.py and that will work perfectly fine as well so let's take that we've now opened up a project on replit now we are not here to print hello world we are here to build a web application and for building web applications in python we use a framework called flask so if you just go online and search for flask python you will be taken to this website flask.palettesproject.com flask is one of the most popular web frameworks in python and flask is actually really easy to use and let's check the installation and the quick start sections to understand how to use it every library you come across will have some sort of an installation and quick start or getting started section or maybe a quick tutorial that you can follow so installation simply requires us to run so here it says create an environment etc we're not too interested in all that right now because we're already using a cloud environment but within the activated environment use the following command to install flask so this is what we need to do we need to run pip install flask so i'm going to go here i'm going to go into the shell not the console because the console is just tied to the run button but the shell and i am going to run pip install flask and that's going to now install flask for us now we can go back into the flask tutorial and now we can head into the quick start and here is what a simplest possible web application in flask looks like so here there are two things this is the module so when we set pip install flask the module with the name flask got installed and modules always have lower case names so from flask and then we say import and from the flask module we want to import the flask class even though these both are called flask it's a bit confusingly named but inside the module flask there is a class called flask with a capital f so i'm going to import flask and now we need to create an app an app is simply an object of the class flask okay so python has something called object oriented programming built inside it and what we are doing here is we are importing a class and then we are creating an object of the class now if that doesn't make sense don't worry about it all we are doing here is importing functionality from flask and putting it into this variable called app so we are creating a flask application by typing flask this way now the only thing that we need to add here is a name every time you create a flask application you have to give it a name and typically inside any python script you already have this variable called underscore underscore name underscore underscore defined if i for example just type print underscore underscore name underscore underscore and run it you're going to see here that it prints underscore underscore main underscore underscore the name variable refers to how a particular script was invoked if it was invoked using python app dot py the name variable is going to have the value main and if it was invoked from somewhere else the name variable may have some other name okay so now we have created a flask application now once we have created a flask application we then need to create a route now any website that you visit you typically access it using some url for example you may go to jovian.ai and this is the page that is on the url jovian.ai now if i click on profile here you can see that the url has changed to slash akash ns and now there is a different page rendered on this url if i click on learn and click on courses you can see the url has changed to slash learn and now you see something different on this page so what you need to tell flask is when a certain url is requested what should be returned so here in the quick start we are first registering a route a route is simply a part of the url after the domain name so here jovian.ai is the domain name 
and everything after it is called the path or the route. So let's do that. Let's go and register a route here. And the way we do that is we say app with an at character. So this is called a decorator in Python. It's a slightly advanced concept that's often used in libraries to provide some advanced functionality. So we say app dot route and then we have to provide which path we want it to match. So let's say we deploy this website to joviancareers.com. Then this is going to match slash, which is the empty route, which is basically just the home page joviancareers.com. And then we define a function. So we can define a function below this decorator. Hello world. And in this function, let us simply for now return hello world. So what we've done here is we've defined a function which simply returns the string hello world. But by adding this decorator, we've informed Flask that when the URL slash is accessed, then show hello world. And let's run that. And Replit does some setup to manage dependencies on its end. So let's just wait for that. So Replit has its own way of managing Python packages. So that's why sometimes it takes a second or two, but once we run it, we see nothing happens. So nothing happened because if you scroll down here, you can see here that they expect you to run things in a slightly different way. What you need to do is you need to export flask underscore app equals hello or whatever is the name of the file here. It was called hello.py and then you need to type flask run. So what that means is we may have to go back into our dot replit file and change the code here, Python app dot py because flask expects to be run in a different way. So we need to probably change Python app dot py to flask run. And we also need to add somehow this flask app command. Now that's one way to run it. Another way to run it is something that I'm going to show you right now. I'm going to type if underscore underscore name underscore underscore equals underscore underscore main underscore underscore. So here what we are saying is if the variable underscore underscore name has the value underscore underscore main and I'm just checking the equality here and this is going to be the case when we run python app dot py. So let's say if I just print underscore underscore name underscore underscore let me just print I am inside the if now and when we run it it simply says that underscore underscore name has the value underscore underscore mean and i'm inside the if now so here if the script is invoked using the python command then what we want to do is say app dot run so we have created the app but we've not yet run the app and we don't want to use the flask run command instead we want to do it using app dot run and here, when you type app.run, you will see some documentation. You need to provide a few options. The first one is a host and it simply says here, set this to 0.0.0.0 to run on the local development server. So we type app.run host equals 0.0.0.0 and then we pass debug equals true. And now we save the file and then we click run. And now you can see that Replit actually opened up a browser within our browser. So this is a fake browser that Replit has opened up for us. So we have imported Flask and then we have created a Flask app, a Flask application. And then we have registered a route to the application. And finally, we have checked if we are running this app.py file as a script, as Python app.py, then we want to start the app by using app.run and we want to run it on 0.0.0.0. This is always something that you have to put in so that it runs locally. And we said debug equals true so that every time we make a change, like if I change this to hello Jovian, that's going to now change to hello Jovian. And just like that, we have created our first web application. You'll see here that this is a browser that Replit is showing us just for the preview sake, but you can also open up this browser in a new tab and that shows you hello Jovian. And you can see that this is deployed at this location, Jovian careers website dot akashness at repl .co. So this is one of the benefits of working with Replit that you can take the work that you're doing and you can share it with other people even while you are developing it. 
Replit is not great for production workloads, so you should not be sending a lot of traffic to this site. And in fact, specifically here, it tells you that this is a development server, don't use it in production. But it is great for testing, it is great for quickly prototyping and showing something to your colleagues or your friends. So now we have already built our first web page using Flask and we can see it running and we can share it with others as well. So we've done that. Now the last thing I want to show you is once you've done some work on Replit and you want to save it back to GitHub, how do you do that? So right now if you see here, if I reload this page, GitHub still has the old version of the repository. It does not have all the changes we've made on Replit. So just like we might do some development locally and then push our changes to GitHub in the same way, we can come in here into the version control tab and on the version control tab, we can review the changes that we've made. So it looks like we've modified all of these files and then we can commit and we can push. I can simply type what I've changed. So added the flask project and I am going to click commit and push and that's going to save all of these changes. It is going to create a git commit and it is going to then push these changes back to the main branch of the original repository, Akashinis slash Jovian Careers website. So if I go back to github.com now and I reload the page, you can see here, now we have a bunch of other files, but most importantly, we have this app.py file and this app.py file now contains the route hello world. So if you want to learn more about how GitHub works, then you can check out this tutorial on GitHub. And if you want to learn more about Replit, how it works, then you can check out this tutorial on Replit. And similarly, there is a tutorial on Flask as well that you can check out. We completed the first step, which was to create a project on GitHub and then open up that project on replit.com. Then we created and ran a Flask web server, as you can see here. And finally, we push those changes back to GitHub so that we can share our project with others. Now we are going to start introducing some HTML and CSS. So let's start with that. Now if we come back here to the files tab and create a folder called templates. So you can see here I've used the plus add folder button and created a folder called templates. And inside this folder, I'm going to add a file and I'm going to call this file home.html. So this file is going to contain the information that I want to show on the page that is being rendered here. Right now we are simply showing the information, hello Jovian, but we probably want to show something more than that. We probably want to show a nice web page with some information, some pictures, some jobs. So all of that we will be putting into this file home.html. HTML is the language that is used to create web pages and you can check out any tutorial on HTML. So the one that I would recommend is htmldoc.com. It's really easy to get started and you can just go in htmldoc.com and open up the get started page and just create an HTML page and it contains a whole bunch of information on how to create HTML documents. But this is the most basic structure of an HTML document. You have something called a doc type declaration at the top. So this tells the browser what kind of a document you are sending. So if I type doc type HTML, when we send this HTML to somebody's browser, we're informing that we are writing HTML code and then you create what's called a tag. So in HTML, everything is constructed using tags. Any website you see on the internet is constructed using HTML tags. So here the root tag or the outermost tag is called HTML. And this is how you create a tag. You have a less than, and then you have the name of the tag, and then you have a greater than. So this is how you create the opening tag. And then similar to the opening tag, there is a closing tag. And there is a slash at the beginning here after the less than symbol to indicate that this is the closing tag. So basically what we're saying is that within the HTML tag, we want to put some information. So the root of your document, the outermost tag in your document is always going to be the HTML tag. Now inside the HTML tag, we generally put two tags. We put head and we put body. So body is what you want to actually show on the page and head is some other information 
Typically, this is what you want to show in the title bar. You can put that information here. If you want to include any styling declarations or CSS, we generally put that in the head. If you want to include any external JavaScript libraries for interactivity, we put that in the head. So the head is just information that will be used to render some things on the body. The body is the actual information that is going to get rendered. So in the head, typically one thing that is commonly put inside the head is the title. And I'm going to call this Jovian careers and let's just save that for now. And inside the body is where you would put some information. So here, let me just write, hello there. You'll learn about the job openings at Jovian here. So let me save that as well. So we've created some HTML file inside a templates folder, but how do we use it within the app? To use a template, we use the render template function from Flask. So from Flask, we import render template and instead of returning just a string hello world, we say render template and then we give it the name of the template. So in this case, the template is called home.html. So I'm just going to pass in home.html and there you go. Now inside home.html, we are saying, hello there, you'll learn about the job openings at Jovian here. And that's what shows up here. And you can also open it up in a new tab and check the same thing. Hello there, you'll learn about job openings at Jovian here. Now, not only that, if you see carefully here, you can see that now this says Jovian career. So we have also set the title of this tab. Apart from the title, we can actually also set this icon. So just like you see all these different icons here, we can actually also set these icons. This is called the fav icon, F-A-V-I-C-O-N. And I'll let you figure that out, how to change the fav icon using a Flask template. So let's bring that back here now. So great, we are making progress already. We are now starting to show some information about what we want to actually display on the site. And we are doing this using a template. Now, before we go further and try to just code the site directly, it might be easier if we first figure out what exactly we want to show on the page. And this is where you should put your laptop away and maybe start working using pen and paper and try to just draw out what you want to display on the page before you actually try to code it. Because if you don't have a clear picture of what you want to show, then writing the code for it can get somewhat tricky. So here I'm going to use a virtual whiteboard, but please feel free to use pen and paper to do this. And here I'm just going to draw a rectangle to represent the browser. And now I'm going to just put some information here inside, which will give me a guide for what I want to actually show on the page. So now let me go here and select the typing tool. Let's give this page a title, Jovian careers, and let's make that a little bigger. We can also change the color here. So let me make that dark. So now here I'm going to have a title on the page called Jovian careers. Then I am going to put an image on the page. So here there's going to be just like a banner image. And I don't know what I'm going to put in this banner image, but for now, let me just draw some hills and let me draw a tree. The idea is I just want to tell myself that there's going to be an image here. Let me draw a river or something. And then there is going to be maybe some information about Jovian. So I'm going to type about Jovian here and I'm going to make that a little bigger. And I just want to have a few lines of information talking about Jovian. So I don't want to put any actual text here. I'll just put lines to kind of roughly guide me that this is going to be just some information. And then below this, I am going to show some job openings. So let's call this job openings. And let's bring that a little bigger. So maybe not this big, but roughly about this big. And this is called wireframing. What you're doing here is you're creating a rough idea of what you want your site to look like. And we don't want to get very detailed in terms of colors and fonts and all those things. We just want to get a rough idea. And then let us maybe list some job openings. Let's see what the job openings will look like. So maybe data analyst is a job opening and Maybe let me use a lighter color here just to emphasize that this is a part of this section. And then under each job opening, I may also want to maybe include where this job opening is based. So let me call it Bengaluru, India. 
and let's make that a little smaller and maybe let's also put an apply button here next to the job opening so now we have an apply button that we want to show and maybe right below the job opening let's also show a line a quick separator and let me now take this and duplicate this a few times to get a list of job openings So now we have a second job opening again it's all approximately correct it doesn't have to be 100% aligned and now we have a third job opening and now we have a fourth job opening and that's it and maybe right below the last job opening let's put a button called contact us and that's actually not bad so let me just change that to data scientist let me change that to backend engineer let me change that to front end engineer and let me change this to remote let me change this to san francisco usa let me change that to delhi india we just spent four or five minutes designing this wireframe and all we've done here is we've figured out what we want to display on the page. So we want to show Jovian careers, we want to show a picture, we want to show about Jovian, some information about Jovian, we want to show some job openings and for each job opening, the title, the location and then an apply button to apply for the job opening. And a contact us button at the bottom in case somebody wants to directly contact us for whatever reason. So this is always a good idea whenever you're doing any form of web development it's always great to start with a wireframe first and make it as quick and dirty as possible. So what I've done here is I've actually created three wireframes. So this is the one page that we have about Jovian open positions and contact us. And along with this I've also created a couple more wireframes. If you click the apply button then we will go to a job details page. Here we have the data analyst job where we have the responsibilities and the requirements of the job and the salary information for the job. And below it, we are going to have an application form. And in this application form, these are the fields we're going to have. And this is what is going to get submitted. And after submitting, we are going to show this page which says your application has been submitted and you'll reach out with the next steps. Now, this is what you should create to just brainstorm with your team or just figure out if this is what you want to work on, if there are any major changes required, if we have all the information or not. And then you can maybe try to either convert it into a more detailed design or you can start coding directly. Either is fine. But this is the information that we want to get onto the page. And we've done that by creating a quick wireframe. So now keeping this wireframe next to us, let's start creating the page. So the first thing we want to show here is Jovian careers. And we want to make this big. We want to make this really big. How do we make it big? Well, that's what HTML headers are for. Now, if we go back on HTML tutorial here, you can see here that there are six levels of headings available on HTML. So I'm just going to click on headings. This is part of the HTML beginner tutorial. And under headings, you can see that this is how you create a heading. You create a tag called H1 and then you put some information inside it and then you close the tag with a closing tag. And then you have H2 and you have H3 and so on. So let me just go back here and let me just put an H1 here. And now as soon as I change this to H1 you can see that this becomes big. Next we wanted to have an image. Let me try and add an image here. So how do we add an image? Again we go back here, we check HTML tutorials, how do we add images? I'm going to click on image and it looks like this is how you add an image. So an image is a self closing tag because there's nothing that you put inside the image tag. You just give it a source. So here now we are seeing for the first time something called an attribute apart from a tag and something inside the tag. So for example, here we have something inside the H1 tag Jovian careers. Here we don't have anything inside the tag, but we have this SRC information here. So let me just take that IMG SRC. Actually, let me just do that here. IMG SRC equals some information and close that. And SRC is going to accept a URL. So let me copy this URL and let me come and paste that URL in here and let's run that. 
and you can see that this is not loading up maybe there's some issue maybe this image does not exist but in any case we don't want to show this url we want to show some nice picture about career growth about work and things like that so one good place to find good images for your websites is unsplash.com that's u n s p l a s h unsplash.com and on unsplash.com you can find royalty free images which means that you don't need to buy these photos to use them you can use them commercially and i'm just going to search for career and this one looks nice this one looks interesting so i'm just going to download this picture here and i'm going to put this in here and let's also rename this let's call this banner.jpeg and jpeg is simply the file format and now we want to show this file banner.jpeg here so where exactly is this file right now this file is on our computer and our computer is not accessible on the internet so we need to take this file and put it somewhere where it can be accessed by our flask application and that's where there is this folder called static so this should be outside templates not inside let me just move it out so i've created this folder called static and anything that you put under the static folder will be directly shared by flask externally so if i just upload a file here so i can click upload file and i can select banner.jpeg and then you can see banner.jpeg got added here but i want to move it inside static so i'm going to move it inside static and now flask will allow you to access this file using the url let me open this in a new tab so this is the url of the server this is where we are rendering the route slash but if you type slash static s t a t i c and then you type the name of the file banner.jpeg you will see that we have this file here right here so what i've done here is simply jovian careers website dot akashness.repl dot co so this was the main website that was getting rendered i've just put slash static slash banner.jpeg and anything that was inside the static folder will show up here with the corresponding url so now i can take this url and let me go back here and now i can put this here under src okay and now you can see that as soon as i put this in now this image file is showing up here of course this image file is a bit too large so on the image tag you can also specify width and height so i'm just going to specify a height now the height is measured in pixels pixels are simply dots on the screen i'm going to just roughly put it at 320 pixels or i'm just going to put 320 and that's going to automatically convert that into pixels and now you can see here this image has been loaded so now we have an image and now under this image we want this information about jovian so let's get that in as well so now we want a smaller heading so let's call that about jovian and now let's add a paragraph of text below it so here now we want some text below it now whenever you are just building out a site you don't want to have to type a lot of text and that's where there are text generators available online so just search for text generator one thing that might help is to just search for lorem ipsum text generator so lorem ipsum is just a standard text that is used often for a lot of websites so here yeah you can just click how many paragraphs you want and you can click generate and it's going to generate some text for you so lorem ipsum.io is the site that you want to go to and here you can just copy all of this code so this is just some text you can use any text but i'm just using a text generator which can generate any amount of text i want and now i am going to put it in a p tag p stands for paragraph so whenever you want to put some paragraph of text you use the p tag and inside the p tag i have put in lorem ipsum and now we have jovian careers we have an image we have about jovian so it's shaping up well and now below about jovian we want to have another section and now this should be called i believe job openings or open positions so let's use this one open positions so let's just call this open positions and then here we are going to again show the jobs here so let's mark this as a to do that's something that we'll implement later and then finally at the very end of this we will have a button called contact us so again i'm using the button tag here so how do you know which tag is the appropriate one to use that's where you should probably work through an html tutorial 
So here on the HTML tutorial, you can see what are all the different kind of things you can create using HTML and what the different tags are. So go to htmldoc.com or go to w3schools.com. But you've already learned some of the most common tags, h1, img, h1 is header, h2 is header, img is image, p is paragraph, button is just button. So now we have Jovian careers, and then we have about Jovian, and then we have open positions, and then we have contact us. So the structure of the site is there, but of course it looks ugly. It doesn't really look that great. So, so far we have seen how to render templates and use static assets. So anything that you put inside a static folder is typically called an asset, images, etc. are called assets. Then we have seen how to create the layout of the page using HTML tags. And now we are going to start styling the page using something called CSS. HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. It is simply the language used to create web pages and CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. It is used to provide some style to our HTML pages. So let's start adding some CSS now. How do you figure out what to do with CSS? The best way is to do a quick CSS tutorial and you can work through the beginner tutorial. It should take maybe an hour, maybe a couple of hours. But the way CSS works is using something called selectors. So what we do is create something called a style tag in our head. So in the head of the document, we create a style tag. And in the style tag, we need to tell the browser how to apply a certain color or a certain font or a certain layout to a specific portion of the HTML page. One way to do it is by simply specifying a tag. You can say H1 and now you can open curly brackets or braces. So now we are telling the browser anytime you see an H1, which means you see this is an H1, it is highlighted here. So anytime you see an H1, apply these styles to the H1. Now we have made a selection using a tag and now we are going to apply some styles. Every style you apply has two parts. One is what property you want to change. So if I come back here, one thing I might want to change is the font size. This is probably not big enough. So I can say font size. So this is the property. And then what value do you want to set this property to? So you type the property, which is typically a hyphenated word, and you can look up the full list of properties here. So you can go back into the HTML tutorial and you can see what all properties are available to apply to fonts. So you can say something called font family, which is like which font to use, font size, which is how to set the size, font weight, you can make bold, italics, etc. font style, etc. So which property you want to change, font size, and what do we want to change the font size to? Let me try 80 pixels. Any property that is a size of some form is specified using pixels, which is how many dots on the screen it should take up. So let me change that to 80 pixels and let's save that. And now you can see that this has become way too big. So maybe not 80, maybe I want to stick with 40 pixels. Then let's try to change the font family. So the font family is simply which font you want to use. So let me try a font called Roboto. Okay, and you can look up interesting fonts online, but I am gonna try Roboto and let me change that. I think this looks nicer, this looks more modern, so that's nice. Then I can change the font weight. So right now I believe it is set to bold, but if I change this to normal, it'll become thinner. You can see that it has become thinner. In this way, you can make a bunch of changes and this is going to apply to all H1 tags. Now in our page, we only have one H1 tag, but let's say if we had another H1 tag here, maybe below the image. Yeah, you can see here, we have Jovian Careers too, it's going to apply there as well. So these are some text related things. Then let's say I wanna change the color, so I can change the color as well. So you type color and then here you have to specify a color using the RGB scale or the red, green, blue scale. Every color that you see on a screen is built using red, green and blue colors. So you can type RGB and then you can specify the amount of red, the amount of green and the amount of blue to use. So if I put zero, 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 then here we are simply using black. But if I change this to maybe hundred, now you can see that it starts to get redder. Now the values go from zero to 255. So 255 is the highest, zero is the lowest. So now it's complete red. The R value is 255. Then let me try green. So 255, 
and now we have red and green and now it has become yellow because red and green together become yellow let me change that to zero and now this is completely green and you can see all these examples so if you have equal values for red green and blue then it's a shade of gray otherwise it is more mix of a certain color than others a zero is darker 255 is the brightest so i'm just going to pick a medium gray so i'm going to pick something like 180 180 and 180 that looks nice to go darker you have to go lower so let me make that 100 100 100 all right so now we have a nice gray title and we also want to center the title so in the wireframe we drew we had the title in the center but here the title is somewhere in the corner so let's center that and the simple way to center that is to use text align center now do you need to remember all this no you can always just go how to center align text in CSS and find the result directly text align center and that is going to center the text for you so now our text is centered that's nice then we have this image here I want this image to run across the entire page so let me set it up in such a way that it runs across the entire page so I'm going to go to this image and this time I don't want every image to run across the entire page. I just want this one particular image to run across the entire page to be completely wide. So I'm going to give it an ID. Okay, so now we're looking at the second way to select something on the page and apply a style to it. And I'm going to then type hash banner. So whenever you have given something an ID and you want to access it in CSS, so you type the hash character or the pound character and then type the ID that you've given it. And now this will only apply to the tag which has the ID banner. So ID is ideally something that should be unique on the page. Only one element on the page should have an ID. Otherwise your browser may get confused. So now we select hash banner and that is going to select the image banner. And for a moment I'm going to get rid of this height because I'm going to set it using CSS. And now I am going to first set its width to 100%. Let's see that. Okay, so the width is 100% but that's probably too big now so now i'm going to limit the height let me set the height to 360 pixels or 360 dots and i'm just following the same format here property colon and some number and anytime you have a doubt about this you just have to look up some reference and figure it out even after 15 plus years of web development i look these things up all the time so now we have height set to 360 pixels. Let's reload that. So this is looking good, but you can see that the picture is stretched a little bit. And if this was some photograph, then it would look really bad. So then you can unstretch the picture. So there are ways to unstretch the picture. I'm just using something that I looked up earlier called object fit, which is used to make sure that instead of stretching the picture, we simply use the portion of the picture that can fit inside the content. So now this was the original picture. Do something great. You can see here that it was actually quite tall. And now the same thing is showing up here. So now this picture runs across the screen. So that's nice. Now let's go in here and let's change the H2 as well. So for the H2s, I'm going to use the font Roboto again. So font family Roboto then i'm going to use the font size let's see we used 40 for h1 so let me use 32 for h2 and then i am going to use the color maybe let's make this a little darker let's make this 50 50 and 50 and let's make this 100 100 and 100 and finally i am also going to text align center so my h2s you will see that there are two h2s on the page both of them are fixed and now i maybe also want to use font weight normal even and that's nice now finally we have this paragraph tag so let me take this paragraph and let me style that as well Again, I'm just going to use font family Roboto for now all over my page. I like the Roboto font and I'm going to change the color to RGB 80, 80, 80. So now we have Jovian careers do something great about Jovian open positions. 
it's looking better looking better but of course not looking very professional i think one of the things here is that this text is becoming really hard to read because it is going from the left to right so what we may want to put is we may want to just limit the amount of content to somewhere in the center for example if you go to zero to pandas.com one of our courses you will see here that this is slightly more readable because the content is centered it is not expanding to take up the entire space now how do we do that the way to apply such layout related changes is using special tags called div so i'm going to take all of this and put this in a div tag i am going to put this in a div tag and i am going to then give that a little tab so that it's easier to see and now for this div tag i can give it an id so let me give it an id container and then let me select the container hash container and now i want to limit the width of this container and the way to limit width is using something called max width again all you need to do is look up how to limit the width of a div and let me give it 720 pixels as the max width and let's see so now it is limited taking up less space on the screen but i do not want it to be on the left i want it to be centered now the way centering is achieved in css is by providing margins and this is where we may want to learn about something called the css box model so if you just look for css box model and look for an image this is basically how a div or any element in html is displayed on a page you have the content and then around the content you can specify something called padding some space and then outside the padding you can specify the border and then outside the border you can specify more space called margin now don't worry if these terms don't make sense yet but the basic idea is anything inside the border is the content and outside the border is the margin so all of these are just different ways of providing space so let's talk about margins and let us try margin left and let us give it a margin of 80 pixels and let's see what happens so if we give it a margin of 80 pixels and i reload the page you can see that now there is 80 pixels of space on the left it's still not centered maybe let me try 200 pixels maybe that will center it okay looks like it's getting to the center but not quite so i may experiment and i may shift it left and right and find the center but what if the screen size changes now suddenly it's off to the left so this is where we can use a trick instead of specifying margin left we can specify just margin and margin takes four arguments so margin can take four values where for the box that you want to apply this margin to you can specify how much margin you want on the top how much space you want on the right how much space you want on the bottom and on the left so in my case i don't need any space on the top so i'm just going to put zero here maybe i want 80 pixels on the left and then i don't want any space on the bottom and then maybe i want 80 pixels on the right but 80 on the left 80 on the right that may not do the job how exactly do you decide what 80 pixels is once it picks 80 pixels on the left there is so much gap on the right that 80 is not going to do it so here's something that you can do in css something that you will do very often is make the left and right margin auto then the browser decides that it has to give an automatic margin on both left and right and suddenly it gives you an equal margin so whenever you want to center something on the page just use margin zero auto zero auto or you can also just say zero auto and it will take this value and apply to the top and bottom and it will take this value and apply to the left and right so margin zero auto is a quick way to center something on a page so this is definitely looking better there is a contact us here at the bottom let's center that as well so here's what i'm going to do i am going to just put another div around this and what you need to do is you actually need to apply text line center on this container and that is going to center the button here now just for this creating an entire style declaration may become too much work so what i'm going to do is i'm going to apply the style inline so this is another way of applying css where you can apply styles inline on a page so i'm just going to set style equals and i'm going to set text align center 
and whenever you have just one or two small properties to put you can always just do that and now that has centered the button on the page one way of applying css is in the style tag in the head and then in the style tag you can select by tag you can select by id and one other way of applying CSS is by directly specifying a style and then the property colon the value within the tag itself as an attribute using the style attribute. Now I want to show you one last way of uh, specifying styles which is not using tags and not using IDs which is using something called class. Now here we have a bunch of paragraphs right we have this paragraph here and then we have this paragraph here and because we have styled the P tag both of these paragraphs got affected by the p tag but let's say we also had another paragraph somewhere here at the bottom saying copyright 2022 jovian and we did not want to apply the same style to this bottom tag as well maybe we want the copyright 2022 jovian to be small not big like this and maybe we also don't want it to be in the roboto font so how do we do that this p is going to apply to all the paragraph tags so here is what we can do we can go into the paragraph tag and we can say class and we can now give it a name let's call this class body text you can call it anything you want the class name doesn't matter and let's call this also body text and let's not give this class to this third p tag okay and now instead of styling the p tag let us style the body text class so now we want to say dot body text and what this will do is any element whether it's a p a div whatever any element that has the class body text specified like this class body text is going to get these styles and any element that does not have the class body text is not going to get these styles so now if you see here this got applied body text this got body text but this did not get the styles that we applied using the class so that is the third way to apply CSS styles. Okay, so now we have one way which is to specify a tag name and then specify properties and values. Then we have another way which is to use an ID. And then we have third way which is to use a class. And the ID is specified using hash. The class is specified using dot. Now remember ID, ideally there should only be one element with a particular ID on the page because that's what browsers expect. ID is identifier, it is unique. Class can be applied to many elements. That's the difference between ID and class. And another way to apply CSS is directly using the style tag. So with that, now we have done some basic styling. So that's fine. We have now styled the page using CSS classes, properties and values. Now one thing I want to show you is how to use a framework for faster development. Instead of having to type all the CSS manually for every website that you build, you can use pre-existing set of styles that have been created by some good designers because you may not have great design skills. I certainly don't as you can see. So you can use pre-designed styles and you can simply apply those styles to your page by specifying classes. So here's what I mean. Let me first save this. So let me say added HTML and CSS. Okay, and let me come back here and let me get rid of all these styles. Okay, and I'm also going to remove this one piece of style that I have here. And I'm going to maybe also remove this body text for now. I'm just going to make it really basic, just the HTML. Let's get rid of this as well. And now let me go online and search for this library called Bootstrap. Bootstrap CSS. So getbootstrap.com is the website. And on getbootstrap.com, you will find this library, the CSS framework, which can be used to apply styles easily to any website that you're building. So let's click read the docs and let's see how to get started so first it says that you need to create a project you need to have an html file i think we have an html file already we have the file home.html that we are already working with and here it says that you need to add these couple of extra tags this is just some information so that bootstrap works properly we're not using bootstrap yet so let me copy these two meta tags and pop these into the head all right nothing has changed no change so far as such 
Then it says include bootstrap CSS and JS. So here it says that we want to copy this link tag here and put it in the head. So for now, I'm not going to include the JS or the JavaScript because we're not doing any interactive work right now, but I'm going to copy the CSS. So here, all we need to do is come and paste this link tag. And this link tag is simply a way to add a link to some other resource on the internet inside your HTML page. And what are we linking to? We are linking to the CSS file and you can actually open up the CSS file and see what it contains. You can see that it contains a whole bunch of pre-configured styles for us. So if I zoom in here, you can see it contains like box shadow, focus, font weight, etc, etc. So we don't need to worry about what it contains, but it contains a set of pre-existing styles. And as soon as we add this link tag and save, all these pre-existing styles get applied to our page immediately. So if I reload here, you can see that I already automatically got some really nice styles. Now this still needs some work, but this is looking pretty good. And now if you go here and check the left side, you're going to find a lot of utility classes. The folks who built Bootstrap have already implemented a lot of styles, a lot of CSS, and to apply those styles, all we need to do is add the appropriate classes into our HTML. So here's what I mean. Let me show you an example. Let me go into containers and it says containers are a fundamental building block of Bootstrap. They contain and align your content within a given device or viewport. Okay, all that is nice. And here it says that there is a class container. So dot always means class, right? So there is a class container which sets a maximum width with proper breakpoints. So let's not worry about all that. Let's just do this. Let us copy this class name container and let us come to the outermost div here and let us type class equals container. Okay, all I'm doing here is just giving my outer div a class called container. And what has that done? That has now ensured if I reload the page here, you're going to see that that is now centered my content on the page. Okay, the image is causing a problem. So let me just get rid of the image for a second. This is now centered my content on the page. You can see that automatically left and right margins get added for the page. So that's great. And you can see that the fonts have also changed. Fonts are also looking nice. Text is looking nicer, more modern. So that's all nice. The image was causing a problem. So let me add back that image and let me see what I can do about images. Let's see here, images. So images are made responsive by adding the IMG fluid class. So what if I just do this? If I just take this and give my image a class. IMG fluid. Okay, and now this image is rendering nicely. Now, of course, I may still want to do some more styling on my own. So under the link tag, I can still open up a style tag and let me give this image the ID banner. So it already has the ID banner. So let me now still limit its height to 360 pixels. Let me set its object fit cover. I may also want to send the width. So width 100%. Yep, the image is looking nice. Now I want to center this. Now how do we center it? Now let's see here. If I go back here and maybe search for, I can always do this command K and let me just search center and let's see text center or center text. Yep. So it looks like there are some text alignment classes. So if you want to center some text, all we need to do is provide the class text center. So if I come back here and I just want to center this heading. So I say class text center. And now that is centered for us. And similarly for the H2 as well, I'm going to provide the class text center. That's going to center that. And let's provide text center. And that's going to center that. It's looking nice. I think one thing that I also want to do is maybe make this text a little bigger. So let's see. Let's go up here. I think there is another section on typography somewhere. We have content typography and here we have headings and here we have lead. This, this looks interesting. I like this. So there seems to be a class called lead that I can add to a paragraph. 
So I'm going to come into this paragraph and I'm going to add the class lead and that looks nice. You can see that this has become bigger. This is nice. I may want to add some spacing above this, some margins. So I can again come in here and maybe press command K margin, margin and padding. So looks like there are these classes M1, M2, P1, P2 that can be used for applying margins. So MT is used for applying a top margin. I can use a class number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 or something like that. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to apply some margins. So I can go in here into this H1 and I can say class text center and then give a space and MT for margin top and give spacing above. You see there is some space above and similarly MB for margin bottom and give some space below. Maybe make that MB4. That's nice and I'm going to do the same thing here. MT margin top 2. So we are applying a class MT2 to this H2 and inside the bootstrap.css file there is a rule that says whenever you see the class MT2 apply a margin to the top and MB4 apply a margin to the bottom. This is the H2. Let me apply it for this H2 as well. Alright, this is already looking much better. Let's fix the button as well. So button looks like there are these nice button classes here. Let me see if I can find a nice large button. Okay, I want to make my contact button look like this. So I'm just going to copy this button, button primary, button large. And let me just put that class on the contact button. And now the contact button is quite large. And I can now put the class text center here. And that's nice. Now the copyright, well, maybe we want to add some spacing about the copyright. So I'm going to type MT4 and that's going to just give some space above the copyright. All right, so this is looking relatively much nicer. We haven't added the jobs here, but that's a quick introduction to HTML, CSS, and how to use an external framework like Bootstrap for faster development. Now, again, you don't need to remember any of this. All you need to do is go to Bootstrap, look in the sidebar for what you want to do, and then simply look at an example and copy over the styles from that example. That's a very quick way to build very powerful websites. Bootstrap also has support for sidebars. It also has supports for nav bars and all. So what we've done so far is we set up a Flask project. We created a project on GitHub. We opened it up on Replit. All different tools, but they're just there to make our work easier. We then created and ran a Flask server. Then we saw how to push changes back to GitHub. Then we created a template. So remember, we put it inside the templates folder. And then we rendered the template in the app using render template. Then we styled the page using CSS classes. And then we used Bootstrap to make our development faster so that we don't have to write a lot of CSS. We don't have to become designers. The Bootstrap team can take care of that for us. Now let's talk about how to show dynamic data on a web page. It may not be a good idea to just list all the jobs directly in the HTML file because every time we want to add a new job, we'll have to go into the HTML file and change something. And every time we have to remove a job, we'll have to go into the HTML file and change something. And making changes directly inside an HTML file can be tricky. Often what is done is the data is stored somewhere else in a database where administrators can directly just create jobs within that database. And then information is fetched from a database and entered into an HTML file and then displayed on the screen and sent to the browser. So we are not going to connect to a database just yet, but we are going to simulate something similar. So I'm going to create a Python list called jobs inside which I'm going to store the information about the jobs that I want to keep track of. And I'm going to give each job an ID. So I'm going to give this job an ID one and let's give the title of this job data analyst. And let's set the location of this job to Bengaluru, India. And then let's set the salary as well. Let's set that to maybe rupees 10 lakhs. 
and let's create a few more of these so let me copy this over let me add a data scientist role here and let's change this to Delhi that was 10 lakhs and that is 15 lakhs and then let's add another job maybe let's change the ID here as well so this is the kind of information that you would typically get out of a database but for now we're just storing it in a variable so let's maybe put this and call this front-end engineer and let's make that remote and let's make that 12 and let's put in back-end engineer and let's put in here San Francisco USA and that will be in dollars so let's just change that to dollar 120,000 so now we have information about the jobs now we somehow want to send this information into the home.html template and the way to do it is by providing arguments into render template so let's provide an argument called jobs and you can call these arguments anything you want so let's provide this jobs argument and into this jobs argument let us pass the value of this list of dictionaries so now I can go in here in home.html and now here we have this place where we want to show the jobs I can come back here and here now I can use some special syntax now this is not HTML this is not CSS this is something that flask has provided it is called a templating syntax it is a way to insert dynamic data into your html and into your css so i'm going to use these curly brackets and here i'm going to put jobs bracket bracket jobs so you see what happened whatever was there inside the jobs list which was passed as the argument jobs is now accessible inside home.html using these double curly brackets we've passed the list and that list got converted into a string and then all of that is going to be showing here but instead if you wanted to pass something else let's say if i go back here and i pass company name maybe this site supports multiple companies so company name equals jovian and now instead of me rendering jovian careers first let me just render careers so it just renders careers but now oops not here this is the page title we want to get the yeah here instead of rendering jovian careers in the h1 let me first just render careers and now let me add a template tag and let me get company name so remember i'm passing something called company name in app.py here so now i can access company name by using these double curly brackets and now it is showing jovian careers so this is the way you pass dynamic information into the HTML templates and that is why these are called templates. These are not going to always be shown the same way because then we'd have to create a whole bunch of files for every page that we want to show. These are going to be filled in with a certain information using these tags. So that's how tags work. Now the trouble is we don't want to show information like this. If you look back at our Excalidraw wireframe, we want to show information like this. This is much nicer. How do we do that? Well, templates support some special syntax as well. We can actually use a for loop inside template. So we can say for job in jobs. So we want to get each job out of the jobs list. Remember jobs is a list. Jobs is a list containing many dictionaries or objects. So for job in jobs, and then we end the for by writing end for. So everything else is going to be inside. And by the way, this is just a good practice. Whenever you open a tag, it's always a good idea to first close it and then move your cursor back inside so that you can keep track. Otherwise, you forget things. So for job and job. So now job is going to contain each individual job. And let me just for once render inside a div. Let me render. And let me change this also to a div. It's not exactly a paragraph, so to speak. So let me just render job now job is a dictionary python dictionary and from the job let me get what information can i get let me just render job title okay so job title let's see now all right so now we've introduced a for loop 
using this special syntax and now inside the for loop we have access to the job variable which in each loop takes the value of the specific job and then we have this title that we are extracting out of the job variable so that's nice now let's style it a little bit let's make it look like this so let me have this div here like I already have and let me make this an h4 and then below it let me render the information about the job location and let me just type the word location here to make it super clear that I'm talking about location okay location Bengaluru India looking good let me make this bold so one quick way to make things bold in HTML is using the B tag again something you can very easily look up how to make text bold in HTML great looks nice I'm just going to set style equals color RGB and 120 120 120 to give it a nice gray color we may need some spacing right now the spacing is a little messed up so I'm going to go back into this h4 tag and I am going to just give it margin bottom 4px let's just see and I'm going to go into this div tag and I'm going to give it margin bottom 16px I could also use bootstrap classes here but this was just easier to do I've got the location in here now let me put in let's put in maybe the salary as well so let's put salary job salary and there you go now we have the salary as well what if salary is not mentioned for a certain role what happens then so let's say this one does not have a salary the front-end engineer role so looks like it rendered empty so how about we go back here and handle that just like you have for you can also use if so I'm going to put an if tag here so percent if percent salary if the key salary is present in the dictionary job then render this div otherwise don't render it and then we have to do an end if so now you can see here front end engine it just says location remote now one thing you might want to do is this same job information you may want to render on other pages as well so what we can do is we can take this layout everything inside the for and I can create a new layout let me call this job item dot html and I'll just put this here and let me just adjust the indentation indentation is very important to understand the structure of the code and now let's come back to home and now inside the for instead of having all that HTML I can just use include job item dot HTML so this is a nice way to organize the information so you can see here that inside home dot HTML if I don't have this include the jobs will not be rendered no open positions but once I include what we are telling flask is inside the for loop each time with the different value of job include the template job item dot html and pass the variables that are available in this template to that template so this is how you can structure your templates you can extract reusable components out of your templates and render a nice layout one other thing we want to see here is this apply button and then this bottom border so let's add those as well adding the bottom border is going to be easy I'm just going to try looking at bootstrap here borders so let's see if you want to add a border at the bottom we just say class border bottom so if I go here and inside job item dot html I can now pass in class border bottom and let's see what that does okay so now you can see that under the job there is a border I may want some spacing so remember the box model if you want some spacing outside the border you use something called margin 
And if you want some spacing inside the border, you use something called padding. It's just different terms. Don't get too confused about it. Something that you can look up. But I'm going to just put a padding bottom because I want some space inside the border. And I'm going to set the padding bottom to 4px. And let's see what that does. Oh, sorry, not here. I should have it in the div. All right, so you can see that some space has come up here. Let me change that to 8px and see maybe that looks nicer. 8px, that looks nicer. So let's reload the page and let's see what we have here. So now we have data analyst and now we have data scientist. Now we have front end engineer and back end engineer and we have a separation as well. One last thing, we just need that apply button over here. Let's try to add a button first. Let me go into command K button. And let's see, this is too bright. So I want to use maybe something like this. And this looks like just this. So I can just copy this over, come in here and let me add that button here. Let me call it apply. Now by default, HTML renders information top to bottom. So you can see that the button came up at the bottom here. But what we want to do ideally is we want to create two columns inside each job listing. So one column is going to be the information about the job and one column is going to be the apply button. And that's where you can create columns in Bootstrap. So let's see how to create columns. So we want to create something like this. We want to create two columns and maybe we want to create like one big column and one small column. And the way you create columns is using the call class. So looks like I can use call nine to create a very wide column. And then maybe I can use like call three or something to create a small column. Let me just try that. So let me just put all of this inside a div, everything except the button I'm going to put inside a div. So the H4, then the div, location and then the salary all of this is inside a div and I'm going to say class equals call nine so this is going to take up nine spaces out of 12 so bootstrap has something called a 12 column layout so the entire space left to right is divided into 12 columns and you can specify for each div how many columns you want it to take and here let me call this class call three, nine columns I'm assigning to the information and then three columns I'm assigning to the button and we'll play with that. Let's see what that does. Okay, it still doesn't do anything. I think the columns have to be inside a row. So we need a div with the class row. So let me just give this the class row, the outer div. And suddenly now it's looking much nicer. So now we have data analyst location Bangalore. I've just copied over some information from here, how to create columns. So first we create a row and then we create two columns within that row. So we first we create a row and then we create two columns within that row. One column has the width nine and one column has a width three. And you can also play with this. You can maybe make this width two and you can make this width 10. But if you go beyond 12, it is just going to again break into the next line. But this looks nice. So now we have this nice data analyst and then we have apply and everything. And I think it'll be nice to get the apply maybe on the right instead of on the left and also maybe vertically centered. But as of now, it looks fine. It doesn't look bad. So now we have some dynamic data that we have rendered. So we have taken information that was stored inside this list. We have passed it into the render template as a variable. And of course, we've also passed this other variable company name and then inside the home template we are using a for loop where we are getting values out of the jobs variable into job and then we are passing it into this other template called job item dot html where we are actually using information from inside the job item and here we are also using an if it's a lot going on here but it's all just things that you can do step by step and then just look at the appropriate documentation or just search online to figure out how. 90% of web development is probably just looking things up online. Nobody remembers all this from scratch. So that's done. So that's one way to return dynamic data. One other way that some websites allow you to access some dynamic data is using an API. 
instead of returning HTML, we can also return some JSON. JSON is simply JavaScript objects. So let me create another function called list jobs. First, I'm going to register this at the route slash jobs. And I'm going to take the jobs information. I'm going to convert it into a JSON string. So for that, there is this helper function called JSONify. All it does is it takes any object and converts it into a JSON object. So JSONify and give it jobs. And now we have a second route. So now we have a second URL that we have added in our server. So now if I go back here and I open this in a new tab and then open slash jobs. If you see I've added slash jobs at the end, you can see that now I've sent this information as JSON. When people say REST API or JSON API or API endpoint, this is what they mean that your web server is returning some information, not just as HTML. This is the HTML version of that information, but the same information is also accessible in the form of JSON in the form where it's just the data and then you can do whatever you want with the data. So I'll tell you a quick secret. Now you can go to jovin.ai slash akashns for example, and you can get this page containing all of my information or you can go to jovin.ai slash API slash user slash akashns and you can get the same information in JSON format. So if you want to view information about me, you can look at the Jovian page or if you want to just programmatically extract the information about me, maybe you want to programmatically extract information about thousand users and you have their usernames, then you can simply invoke this JSON endpoint or this JSON route and get all that data as JSON and maybe create a CSV out of it and analyze it. So the only difference between creating an HTML endpoint and between creating a JSON endpoint is that instead of rendering a template, you're just using JSONify. And often just to differentiate between HTML pages and non HTML pages, we often tend to put this API name in front of it. API stands for application programming interface. But what it really means is just a URL, which does not return HTML to be shown on the browser, but it returns some structured data in the form of JSON, which can then be programmatically analyzed. So now we've created our first API route. We've created our HTML route. We've created our API route. And this information right now is stored in a variable, but it could very well be coming from a database. Okay. Now enough building. I think this website is looking reasonable. So let's now deploy this website to the cloud. It is already deployed in some sense. It is on Replit, but as I mentioned in the beginning, Replit is better suited for development. Your Repl can shut down anytime because it's free resources and it doesn't really handle large workloads because it's doing a lot of things to help you develop more easily. So now when you want to put it into production, you will have to figure out some cloud platform where you're going to deploy this one cloud platform that makes it really easy to deploy Python applications is called render.com. There are other cloud platforms like Amazon web services and Heroku and Google cloud and Azure, but render is really easy to work with. So that's why I want to show you how to work with render.com. So first I'm going to take my app.py and I am going to then go into version control and I'm going to say added dynamic data and API route. And then I'm going to commit and push. And now this information is sent back to GitHub. So now I'm no longer concerned with Replit. Now all my information has gone into GitHub. So now Jovin Career's website, if I open up app.py, seems to contain all the information that I have put in so far. Now I want to take this GitHub project and deploy it on render.com. And the way I'm going to do it is go to render.com and create an account. And it's free to get started. There's a free plan that you can use. So create an account. And once you've created an account, you will see this dashboard and on this dashboard, you can click new and we want to create what's called a web service, which means we are not just sending some HTML normally, we're maybe also connecting to a database and getting some dynamic data. Maybe we also have some API routes and things like that. So we want to create a web service. A static site is just a set of HTML pages that you want to deploy. No flask, nothing, but we want to create a web service and here, we need to allow render.com to pull your code. So that's where we can click connect account and on clicking connect account. Once again, we are asked which organization or which account we want to use. So I want to do it on my personal account 
and I want to give it access to only the German Careers website and I'm going to just click install and this will ask me for my password and now you can see this repository is connected so now let me click connect now when we click connect we have to just configure this deployment okay now we are going to take the code that is there on github and we are going to deploy it on the cloud using render so we need to configure it first thing here i am going to give this a name let me just call it jovian careers website this is a name for internal reference then environment is python 3 that's fine region is oregon that it doesn't matter it's basically where in the world the server is going to be located branch is main that is the main branch on github where we are developing and then it requires a build command so remember we installed flask at the beginning render.com doesn't know that it needs to install flask so what we need to do for render.com is to create a special file called requirements.txt and it's not that render requires this file it is a standard in the python ecosystem that anytime you have a python project and you want to specify that it requires certain libraries the project requires certain libraries it's a convention to put that information inside a requirements.txt file so i'm going to add a requirement here called flask so that's the one library that needs to be installed on the server and second i am also going to add another library called gunicorn so g u n i c o r n you can look it up gunicorn so what gunicorn does is this is a production server for python remember flask when we ran it it said that it is a development server don't use this for production so whenever you want to put a flask application into production you need to use the gunicorn library it's very simple to use it's the exact same command every single time so we have put in requirements.txt flask and gunicorn and let me just commit that so let's say i added requirements dot txt and i'm going to commit and push and now this is sent to my github repository i can verify that there is a requirements dot txt file here which contains flask and gunicorn so now when render pulls the code it is going to receive the requirements dot txt file and then here it is going to run this build command pip install minus r requirements dot txt all this does is it pip is the package manager for python it is used to install libraries in python and when you say minus r requirements or txt you're just telling pip look into the requirements or txt file and in each line there will be the name of a library and please install that library for me so when render pulls the code from github every time something changes in the repository render pulls the code and then it's going to run pip install requirements or txt and that is going to obviously come across these two lines flask and g unicorn so then it's going to install those libraries and now to start the server we are now going to use g unicorn so g u n i c o r n g unicorn the library when it is installed it also adds a command called g unicorn and this command needs to be given the name of the file that needs to be executed so the file that needs to be executed is app.py so instead of doing python app.py we are just doing gunicorn app.py development production python gunicorn that's the only change so gunicorn app.py but instead of app.py you just put app and then not only that you also have to specify the name of the actual variable which contains the flask application that you want to run now in my case the variable is also called app but let's say this was called flask app then i would have to put something different but we are just going to put gunicorn app colon app now how did i find out all this how did i find that this needs to be the build command and this needs to be the start command i just googled render.com deploy flask application it's not something that i've ever learned before this is something that i looked up just a few hours ago and there is a tutorial on this and it literally tells you exactly this that there is a hello world project that you can check out on github and you can go through this app.py file here and you can see this is what app.py is set up as and then you create a web service on render after signing in and you should set the environment to python you should set the build command pip install requirements or txt and you should set the start command to gunicorn app colon app 
So that's literally what I looked up. And you can see here there is a requirements.txt file which contains Flask and GUnicorn. All of these things are not things that you have to learn or become familiar with or anything. It's just when you need to connect to a specific platform, you need to look up how to do it. And that is often in the documentation. If you are deploying to a platform called Heroku, then this would be slightly different. If you are deploying to a platform like AWS, this would be slightly different. All that matters is figuring out how to make it work. So now we've put in all this information and now we can go in here and select a plan. You can choose the free plan. I'm choosing the paid one because it's going to build slightly faster. And now it is going to create a deployment of this application. You can see that the application will become visible on Jovian careers website dot on render dot com. And it is first cloning the GitHub repository and then it is checking out the main branch. So it's basically getting the latest code. Then it is telling you that it's using a certain version of Python. Now it's installing a bunch of libraries. You can see here it said pip install requirements.txt. So it's done. After all the installation is done, it's going to upload and deploy it. So now it's doing a deployment. And once it is deployed, which means once it is set up on a server and that server is pointed to this URL, we will be able to access it. And how is it going to run that actual server? It's going to run the server by using GUnicorn app colon app. Great, looks like it has started. So now I can go up here and I can open this and I can go in a new tab. And there it is. This is the Jovian careers website deployed on render.com. But what I don't like is that it's on this Jovian careers website dot on render dot com. I want my own site Jovian careers dot com or something. So we'll talk about that in just a second. But what I want to show you now is how easy it is to change things. Now you can come back here and let me maybe change some information here from backend engineer. Let me change this to 150,000. Maybe also let me go into the home dot HTML file template home dot HTML. And here maybe let me change Instead of open positions, let me call this job openings. And let me just go to version control and let me say made some changes. And let me just commit and push. And now those changes are going to come up here. If I just reload again, it says made some changes 10 seconds ago. And now if I come back here and I go into the website again, you see that it has started a new deployment. So every time you push to the main branch, render will automatically take that and try to deploy it. And if the deploy fails, it will continue to use the previous deploy. If the deploy succeeds, then the site will get replaced. Now, suppose for some reason this does not get triggered. You can just click manual deploy and deploy latest commit. And that is going to take the latest code and that is going to deploy it. So this way you can just work on replit and test your changes on the test server, then Use version control to push your changes to Git and render will pick up those latest changes and automatically deploy them. See how easy it is to update your website. So now we've seen how to set up automated deployment each time something changes. So I believe we changed this to job openings and you can see it has already changed to job openings here. Now let's learn how to deploy it to a nice website like jovincareers.com. Now this is where you will need to buy a domain. This part is not free, unfortunately, because you'll need to buy a domain. So you can go to domains.google.com and on domains.google.com, you can actually click get a new domain and I can search for example, jovincareers.com and looks like it is available and it is rupees 860 per year. So I can actually go ahead and buy it. So I can click this button, add my payment information and buy it and so on. I've already bought another one called jovincareers.xyz and once I have bought it, I can configure it to display this website. How do I do it? Again, every platform, every deployment platform will have its own way of doing it. But on render.com, if I go into the project settings here and on the project settings, just find the place where it talks about domains. So it looks like custom domains and you can point a custom domain to this app. So I want to point Jovian careers.xyz let's save that and now once you add the domain jovian careers.xyz then it will ask you to update a dns record don't need to worry about what exactly this means you just have to follow some instructions here 
So it says add a C name record for www pointing to this and add a A name record pointing to this. So I'm just going to copy this thing and I'm going to go here into my Google domain. I'm going to click manage and I am going to click on DNS and I'm going to add a record, right? That's what it said, add a DNS record. So I need to add a C name record for www. So I'm going to select record type C name and www. And then I am going to put the value Jovian careers website dot on render dot com here and I click save. So that's one. Let's add one more. It looks like I need to add one more record. So now I need to add another record and this time it needs to be an A name or alias record. Let's see if we have A name or alias. Okay, there's no A name, there's no alias. Then it says that, okay, do not have A name or alias, then use an A record. So now I need to create an A record. So I'll just go here, I'll create A. It's just already pointing to joviancareers.xyz. So I don't need to put anything here because that's going to just create a subdomain. And then it needs an address. So I need to copy this address and I need to paste this address here. And then I click save and that's it. So now what we have done is we've bought the domain and in the domain, we have configured the DNS, which is simply something called domain name server setting, which means if somebody in the world tries to access the domain, which location should they actually be going to? A domain is simply a redirection to some actual location. And what you said is that if somebody tries to access Jovian Careers or XYZ, they should actually be shown the information that comes from this page, Jovian Careers website dot on render dot com. So let's see, looks like it has been verified. And now if I go to Jovian Careers dot XYZ, you can see that the site that we have just created in the last couple of hours is now live on Jovian Careers dot XYZ. And every time we make a change on Replit, let me change that back to open positions here. And then we just push that to Git open positions, commit and push. Render is going to pick up the latest version and it is going to then deploy that latest version and that latest version is going to be available on jovincareers.xyz. And this is something that you can do right now today with your own site that you want to do. So now we have just completed rendering dynamic data, creating an API route, deploying the project to render.com and connecting a domain with a render deployment. Now we're going to very quickly make some functional and aesthetic improvements to this site so that it can actually be used as a Jovian career site. So the first thing I'm going to do is add a nav bar and footer from Bootstrap. Most websites like this one or like Jovian have a nav bar, even getbootstrap.com itself also has a nav bar. Google has a nav bar. So how about we add a nav bar first so that it looks more like a real website. Now to get a nav bar, I'm going to go into bootstrap examples and you can see here there is an example of headers and I can maybe pick one of these. The way to do this is I just click download examples and that's going to download that for me and I have it downloaded already. And out of those, I'm interested in the headers example. So the nav bars example and let me just open up VS code. And here under headers, maybe let's add, I like this one. So maybe let's get this one. So this is number one, two, three, four, five, number five. So let's see here. This is the first one. This is the second one. This is the third one. This is the fourth one. This is the fifth one. So I'm just going to copy this and I'm going to come back here. I am going to put it into a file called nav.html. And I'm going to just paste it here. And I'm just going to come into home.html and right at the very top here, right after the body starts, I'm going to say include nav.html. And there it is. You can see here that this nav is there. Now this nav is set up in such a way that 
on mobile it renders differently and on desktop it renders differently so if i just open it up here you can see that here it has rendered differently maybe let's pick a slightly simpler nav now that you know how to use a nav i'm going to just go into the docs here and i'm going to search for nav bar and i'm going to pick a slightly simpler nav bar which doesn't have these special qualities just very light very simple come back here and nav.html that's it and let me just change this to jovian and looks like it's using a image as well so i'll just grab that image this is the image it's using i'm just going to save this image as logo.svg and i'm going to come back here into static and i'm going to upload this image here and instead of this src i'm just going to change this to slash static slash logo.svg and there you go now we have that let's also maybe just like we have on jovian we have a white nav bar with a small shadow how do we get a shadow let's search for shadow shadow sm let's just grab that i'm just going to come in here and i'm going to add shadow sm so now you'll see a nice shadow below the nav bar let me reload that okay that's nice now the nav bar doesn't stay stuck the nav bar you can see it moves away so i'm just going to add something called fixed top but now the trouble is that this information shifts up and also it looks like it's showing up behind the nav bar so i'll also give it a background so bg white i'm going to give a solid white background to the nav bar and now you can see here that content goes behind the nav bar all right not bad but i can't see the title here so to fix that we can just come in here into the nav and right below the nav because it is fixed it is kind of popping out of the page so that's why it doesn't have anything behind it so we can just put a div and let's give it a height let's look up the nav bar height i believe it should be about 56 pixels so let's go into this this is a nav bar you can see the height 40 plus 8 plus 8 56 so the nav bar is kind of popping out of the page but we need to put an element behind it at the top of the page to compensate for it popping out so i'm just going to put height 56 pixels and now you can see that suddenly this is now showing up below because of this display great looking nice let's add a footer as well let me go back into these examples here let me check footer yeah there it is footers let's open up index.html let me grab maybe this footer this footer looks nice so this is footer number 3 so i'm just going to open this up in vs code and footer number 3 so that's footer number 1 Footer number two, footer number three. I think this is it. Go back, create a file, footer dot html. Paste that in here. That's our footer. I think here it says company incorporated. Let me just change that to Jovian. And there are a bunch of links here which don't point to anything yet, but we can fix that later. And let me just go into home. and here at the bottom somewhere let's add footer and there you go now you see here copyright 2022 i think maybe i didn't copy the whole thing there may be something we need to change here maybe let me try this one i think this is the one Yeah, there we go. Now we have this nice footer. So now we can go back into home.html and we can get rid of this copyright 2022 part here. Great. So all good so far. We have a footer and then we have a nav bar. This image here it it feels a little weird because it's cut off on the left and right. So let me come back here and let me go into home.html. Let me take this image and let me move it out of the container. So I'm just going to move this image out and this happens all the time where when you see something implemented it doesn't seem as nice and you may want to just change it so let me move that out and let me get rid of this about jovian and let's see what happens now this is much nicer so now we have 
this nav bar. Now we have this image that goes under it. Of course, we may want some padding below it. So we may say margin bottom 16 pixels. And there we go. Okay, so this is nice, but I would like to have maybe an image here on the right just to showcase how nice it is to work at Jovian. So I'm going to go back to unsplash.com and let me just search for people working. So obviously these will not be Jovian employees, but let's get them in here. Let's just call this people and let's go back into templates. Let us go into static, add that in there and let me add this image here lead i'm going to put a div around it and put a div around that i am going to add the image here below this img src equals slash static slash people dot jpeg and let's set a height for it height 320px now here i'm going to apply a class row and then here I'm going to apply call six and then here I'm going to apply call six as well. Let's see what that does. So now we have this nice image on the left. I can even give this a nice border. So let me say border radius 4px and now we have a nice border here. I think we may want to give some margin below the image. So style equals margin bottom 16px. Okay, that's nice. Now this is looking nice on desktop, but I think on mobile, we probably may not want this image. It's a little messy. So what you can do is you can do a couple of things. You can say you want this to be six only on medium devices and bigger. So that's where you can say call MD six. And here you can say that you want this to not be displayed D none and D MD block. So basically you don't want it to be displayed on mobile and you want it to be displayed only on medium screen. So now you can see Jovian careers here is just showing the text and not showing the image and showing open positions. And here, Jovian careers is also showing the image. But the apply buttons don't quite work right now. And unfortunately, they cannot work right now because we have not implemented the second page. But we can do a quick trick here. So what we can do is clicking on the apply button can actually just open an email address to somebody from the Jovian team. And maybe the email can already have a pre-populated subject. So here, instead of using a button, we can change this to an anchor tag. So that's again something you will learn when you look at HTML in a little more detail. So now we've not made any change yet, but now we can do this. We can point this to some URL. So let me just point this to google.com to show you. And now when I click on this, it's going to open google.com. You see, so the A tag, is used to create links in HTML and the target of the link is simply specified using the href attribute of the A tag. So you're probably aware of links like HTTPS and HTTP that are open in the browser, but there's a special type of link called mail to. So if you search for mail to links, what they do is they open your email program. So you can actually do this mail to this and you can also in fact include a subject here. And you can in fact not only include a subject, you can include a body and a lot of other things. So let me just do this. Mail to hello at jovian.ai question mark subject equals application for and let me get the job name here. So job title. Let me just do that. And now when I click on this link, it's going to now open a mail application and it's going to type this mail to hello at jovin.ai application for data analyst and it's going to be sent from your email and whatever mail application you have configured on your phone or on your desktop or whatever. So if I go in here, there is a tool here called mail to link dot me and if I just change this to hello at jovian.ai and 
application for xxx and body my name and here you can just ask the person to put the name and my resume link resume link and my linkedin link linkedin link so here we can go and construct a mail to url so i'm just going to copy this mail to url i'm going to come back here i'm going to paste this mail to url here in the href okay and all i'm going to change here is application for instead of xxx i'm going to change this to application for job title and now let's try that and now it opens mail and you can see here that it has created a sort of form that somebody who wants to apply can simply fill out and send the mail and we will get an email and we can do the same thing for contact so let's go into contact as well and let's construct question about job openings and let's just put my question enter question here and let's just copy that and i'm going to go back into the code into home going to go into the contact button change that from a button to link all that we need to change is just change the tag and we type href equals such and such and now our contact button is going to work as well so there you go my name my question and that's it so now we have a fully working site now we can of course fix these links as well so we can go in here into our footer.html and we can fix the links that we're looking at so home we can point to jovian.ai and let me change this to courses and let's change that to jovian.ai slash learn let's change let's call this events and let's send that to jovian.ai slash events and by the way if you want a link to open on a new tab you provide a target attribute underscore blank and that's going to open it in a new tab again something that you can easily look up if you just search how to open a link in a new tab okay html is all about just constantly looking things up and let's fix this also to jovin.ai slash about and there you go so now we have almost a fully working site we can probably add a couple of links here the same links that are there in the footer but if i click on home it opens the jovin site if i click on courses it opens the jovin courses if i click on events it opens up events and contact us opens email apply opens email it mentions the name of the role that you're applying to so if i click on backend engineer you can see here it puts application for backend engineer if i put front end engineer it puts application for front end engineer and so on so there we just added mail to links and we've already been using proper files to organize our templates because now we can reuse footer nav and job item on other pages as well and it's also just easier to read the code when it is in multiple files so we've done some refactoring as well so that's it we just created a functioning site let me just save this so let's just call this functional and aesthetic improvements and let's commit and push that and by the time we are done recapping it should be deployed so what did we do today we started out by setting up a project on github we then opened up that project on replit for development we then created and ran a flask web server by installing flask and creating a flask app and registering a route we then pushed those changes back to github then we learned how to create templates using the templates folder and in the templates folder we put an html file and then we rendered it using render template inside app.py that's all we did and then we added html tags inside it to create the structure of the page and how did we come up with the structure of the page we created it on excalibur.com 
So we created it using a simple wireframing tool. You could do it on pen and paper as well. And then we styled the page using CSS classes. But of course, our design skills are fairly limited. So that's where we use the Bootstrap framework for faster development. And Bootstrap simply offers a whole bunch of helper classes and utilities and even example code to create the kind of layouts that you want to create. Then we saw how to render dynamic data using the templating syntax. We took some information about jobs from a list of dictionaries and we rendered it using a for loop in the home.html file. We also learned how to organize our templates better using the include keyword. So here we have job item.html, which is used inside home.html. Then we deployed that project to render.com. You can see here we deployed it. All the deployments are visible here. Looks like a deployment just went live. And then finally, we also connected a domain. So you can buy a domain on google.com. And all we had to do was put in a couple of DNS records. And now on Jovian careers, dot xyz we have our careers website jovian do something great jovian careers i should probably replace this with some information about the company replace this with maybe an actual photo open positions so it would be nice if there was a form here and all and maybe we'll do that next time but right now it works i can actually share this website and people can click apply and it'll send an email to hello at jovian.ai and they can also contact us and they can use all of these links so we added the nav bar and footer. We added a bunch of mail to links. We made the website mobile friendly. You can actually right click inside your Chrome browser and pull these developer tools to the side and then click this mobile button. And voila, you're looking at your website on mobile. So there you go on mobile. This is what the website looks like. Not too bad. It is usable. Maybe there is some spacing left and right that we can fix but largely it looks fine. So I guess I can share this link over WhatsApp or wherever and people can start applying. So in just a couple of hours from concept to execution, to deployment, to styling, we've built a careers website for Jovian, something that we actually plan to use now. We did not go deep into any one area because this was sort of a walkthrough. Now, what you should try and do is try to replicate this on your own, maybe create a personal website and maybe list your projects there and also in that process, you may want to then go deeper into some of these tutorials, explore the HTML tutorial, explore the CSS tutorial, explore the bootstrap documentation. The more time you spend with it, the more you try things, the better you're going to get at it. And that's all that we have for today. Now, what are some ways in which we can improve this? We can create a page to show the details about the job. For example, requirements, responsibilities, etc. We can also add a form within the same details page to submit an application instead of sending an email. And then we can store the information about the jobs and the applications in a cloud database so that this is fetched not from some object or some Python list, but it is fetched from a database and that database can then be updated. And then the data from that database can be downloaded so we can have information about all the applications in a single place. And finally, when somebody fills an application form, we can also send an automated email confirmation to a candidate and to a Jovian admin after the application. And then we can also create a login interface now, now that people can submit applications, maybe we need an admin interface where we can log in and view the submitted applications, maybe accept or reject applications. And maybe we also create a login application for people to view the status of their job. What you're looking at here, is actually not too far from dsmlbootcamp.com. And you can see this is exactly what we've slowly built upon with more functionality, connecting a database, connecting login and adding forms and such things. But this is all there is to web development. You just figure out what you need to build. Then you find the smallest possible implementation of it that you can ship as soon as possible, ideally within a few hours or within a day or within a week. You build it, you ship it, then you identify what you can improve and then you pick up each task and then you keep implementing it and shipping it. And that's all we do as web developers. I hope you've learned enough to try and build your own website and you can dig deeper in the areas that you need to. Congrats on making it to the end of this long and detailed tutorial. I hope you were able to follow along and build your own website. 
please post the website that you've built in the comments because we are giving away one Jovian swag pack every month to the best website built by following this tutorial. And please share this tutorial if you found it helpful. If you help us get to 100,000 views, we will do an advanced web development tutorial and release it as soon as we reach that milestone. So please share, like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.